Great. Thanks a lot, Brendan. It's uh, nice to be here and to talk with you guys tonight. Um, my name is Dan Olson. I uh, wrote a book called The Lean Product Playbook. Um, I'm actually going to be giving away a copy. I'll uh, like tweet, to tweet to end of the raffle kind of thing. But it's basically a guide on how to achieve product market fit. I've spent my whole career in product management and, um, and just wrote a book on how to achieve product market fit. And so I'm going to share some advice from that with you in the time that we have. Uh, just to share a little bit about my background, I started out with an engineering background. Um, I've been coding since I was 10, and then I was an electrical engineering major. Um, after college, I actually worked on submarine design. Um, and uh, after doing that for five years, I knew that I wanted to go to business school, so I came out to Silicon Valley to go to business school at Stanford. And uh, that's where I learned about this awesome career called product management. I said, that's what I want to do. I'd never done it before, so I asked people, where's the best place to do product management? And they said, into it. And so I was lucky to get a job at Into It. I worked there. It was totally a great place to learn product management, marketing, UX design, development. It was great. And early in my product management career, I realized how important UX design is. So I made it a point to learn a lot about UX design. And also along the way, uh, made it a point to stay fresh and current on the web coding technologies as well. And after Into It, I was a product leader at, at a few startups. Um, and then basically I had the itch to do my own startup like a lot of people do and I actually did that. I was CEO and co-founder of Your Version, which was a personalized newsreader. Uh, we launched a TechCrunch Disrupt. We won the People's Choice Award. Um, so I consulted for a little while and then I did that for four years and then I went back to consulting. So I've been consulting and helping product teams for nine years now. Um, and uh, some of my clients you can see here are Box, Facebook, Microsoft, Medallia. And I also run, I'm passionate about sharing best practices and advice. I run a, a big meetup group in Mountain View called Lean Product, Lean UX Meetup. And I've been doing it for almost four years now. We have over 6,000 members. And I host monthly speakers, like the top product and UX experts that are, that are there. So um, that's my Twitter handle. If you want to win a copy of the book, you just got to send a tweet with my Twitter handle in it. And uh, I post all my slides on my website, dan-olson.com. Um, and the book, you know, my book, it, it's a lean product playbook. It's mainly a product management book, but it does have the word lean in it. And, um, lean startup is definitely. Oh, hold on here. Lean startup uh, is definitely become very popular. You know, I've been giving this talk for a long time. It used to be called How to Be a Lean Product Ninja. That's why I have the Lego Ninja guy there. Um, that's what led to the book being written. Um, and I used to talk to audiences like this. I say, Who's heard of Lean Startup? And a few hands would go up. And over time, more and more people. Why don't we do? Who's heard of Lean Startup? Raise your hand if you've heard of Lean Startup, right? If you haven't heard, you're like almost embarrassed to put your hand up because everyone else's hand is up, right? So you don't have to admit it if you haven't heard of it. But anyway, it, most people know about it. And if I had to say, hey, you know, what, what are the main points? If you had to summarize what the main points of Lean Startup are, what are they? And I think there are these bullet points here on the slide. It's, it's about getting explicit about your hypotheses. When you're building a new product, you're basically making tons of decisions and assumptions along the way. And so it's about, again, explicit getting those out of your head, down on paper, so you can then figure out what's the fastest, easiest way to test your assumptions and see if you're right or not. Um, it's about deliberately keeping your scope small. You know, like in the old days, you would have a team of engineers go off into a cave and code for 18 months and come out and launch what they just coded on the world, and then they'd find out nobody wanted what they just built. Right? So it's about how do we make sure that we, um, we don't really invest a lot of resources until we have confidence that we're going in the right direction. And that's where the, comp the concept of MVP, minimum viable product, comes in that I'll be talking about a bit tonight. It's about getting out of the building and talking to customers and testing your ideas with them. Um, and it's about learning and iterating, hopefully quickly, with the ultimate goal of achieving product market fit. Now, as I list these bullet points, I see a lot of people kind of nodding along. Sounds pretty, sounds pretty easy, right? <laughs> right? But it's actually, it's not, it's not easy. Um, it, at the high level, you understand the bullet points, but what I found is a lot of people, when they get down and say, great, I just read the book, the Lean Startup book, or I just went to a talk, or I just read a blog post, when they go back to their uh, team to try to do it, they run into challenges and obstacles at a tactical level. And the reason I share Lean Startup concepts is because, I, in my mind, there's a big overlap. You know, hold on. This is blocking the signal. It's a big overlap between Lean Startup and product management, right? And so I think Lean Startup helped product management out a lot because it gave us a lot of vocabulary and concepts, you know? So Lean Startup kind of took a lot of concepts and brought them together, like uh, MVP wasn't invented by Lean Startup, it was actually invented by someone else, but it made it popular, right? Product market fit, pivot, all these concepts. So it gives a vocabulary and some common framework. So in my mind, there's huge overlap between uh, Lean Startup and product management, but you can also just think about my book as, as a product management book, because that, that's really what my career's 
and then in. And because I you know, saw so many teams um, who got it at a high level and were motivated at a high level but didn't get it at the tactical level, ran into struggles, that's basically why I wrote the book, The Lean Product Playbook. And it's a playbook. And if you read the Amazon reviews, many of them comment on how, wow, this is the only book that actually tells you exactly like the steps to follow. Um, it's, very, it's very tactical like that. So it, it addresses that need of, well, what am I actually supposed to do right now? Um, and as I said, I'm going to give away a copy. We have one right here. And if you want to know how to win a copy, you basically just tweet with that Dan Olson. And I've got this cool tool that randomly draws someone that tweet, tweets with Dan Olson, right? And um, if, you know, if there's a slide that you like, your photos are great. If there's a slide that you like, the framework or whatever, that's cool. Um, also, if you could add a hashtag, then other people that aren't in the room will also see it as well. So hashtag product management or hashtag lean startup, that'd be great. Um, and basically, you know, anytime you have a big movement like lean startup, there's a lot of buzzwords like pivot, MVP, product market fit. Um, some of them are quite contentious. Like you can go online and find people having arguments about what an MVP is and what an MVP isn't. Right? It's kind of funny to read those. Product market fit is a little different. People don't argue about what it means. They almost talk about it too simplistically. And they talk about it like some true or false condition of existence. Like it's like, oh, Box? Box succeeded because they had product market fit. Startup X, oh, Startup X, sadly, they failed because they did not have product market fit. It's just like this yes or no, true, false condition. It's not really helpful if you're trying to actually achieve it with your product. And if you Google it, there's not a lot of advice out there. So that's why I wrote this book. Um, and based on my engineering background, if I'm trying to accomplish something like product market fit, then I want to have a framework that I can use to define what it is and, and how to achieve it. And so the key framework from the book is the product market fit pyramid. It's a model for product market fit. It has five layers. It is a pyramid. Let me walk you through it, basically. <clears throat> the bottom two layers are the market layers. It all starts with the target customer. That's the foundation of the pyramid. And like a pyramid, each layer is meant to build on the layer beneath it, basically. right? So it's like, whose life are we trying to make better? Who are we trying to create value for? It's important to start with that, because everything else changes. If you focus on one customer versus another, everything else is going to change. The next level of layer up is, for that customer, what are their underserved needs? Right? So we're going to be focusing on customer needs. And within the needs for that customer, we want to not address the ones that are already either happy with how they're being met today, but have some way of identifying which ones are being underserved or unmet. And we'll talk about that more. But basically, those two together are a market. It's a group of people that share a set of common needs. And if you look in a marketing or economic textbook, that's what it'll say the definition of a market is. So that's how I like to think about that. And these are basically hypotheses that you need to get right. The whole point is, if you get all these hypotheses right enough, then you'll achieve product market fit. Your product, I like to represent with these three layers. It starts with your value proposition. Your value proposition is, OK, which customer benefits are we going to say that our product actually delivers on? And how are we going to be better than the other products that are out there? Right? That's where product strategy comes in. And it's, it's hopefully it builds on the underserved needs, but it may or may not, depending on, on how you're doing. The next level up is a feature set, which is actually the functionality that conveys those benefits to the customer. And that's where the concept of MVP comes in. We don't want to overbuild or overscope before we're confident that we're going in the right direction. And then the final layer of the product uh, section is user experience. Right? That's what actually brings the functionality to life that your user interacts with uh, to use the product. Right? And so basically, um, you, you're making all kinds of decisions and assumptions up here. You can't really, these are in your control. These are not really in your control. You can pick which one you want to go after, but you can't like change people and say, oh, you have this need that you don't know about, things like that, right? So this is kind of, you're deciding on who you're going to go after. Here you're making your decisions. And basically, product market fit is just, hey, how well do all the decisions we're making up here, how well do they resonate with the market that we're trying to address? That's product market fit. And once I had that framework, I realized, you know, as I said, this is just capturing the key hypotheses you need to get right. You need to get this right. If you get this right, this right, that right, that right, and that right, then you'll have product market fit, right? Um, turning into a process where you can work through those key hypotheses and assumptions. And so the lean product process is what I'm going to be walking through today and sharing an example at the end. It's basically just starting at the bottom and working your way up, getting clear on what's our hypothesis about who our target customer is, what do we think their underserved needs are, you know, what's our value proposition going to be? Which needs are we going to actually deliver in our product? And how are we going to be better than the competition? Uh, what should our functionality be? And that's a tough thing for MVP. You know, it's easy to put in too much. Um, but what's the bare minimum that we can put in? Um, working through the user experience design. And then there's a sixth step, which is great. Once we have a user experience, 
whether it's a prototype. I'm a big fan of using prototypes, clickable, tappable prototypes to validate your ideas. And you'll see the case study I share at the end. We use that very effectively before you do any coding. Or if you're coding a live product or you have a live product, you can do that. But then you close the loop. And the sixth step is to test with customers. And you close the loop. And that's where you see how you're doing with product market fit. So that's the lean product process I'm going to be walking you guys through today. And uh, again, it's a way to capture your key hypotheses. It's meant to be an iterative process. And um, how many people have heard of the build, measure, learn loop? So a fair number of you, right? So the good thing about the build, measure, learn loop is it got people understanding that, hey, this is an iterative process. You build, you measure, you learn, and then you keep going and doing it. Some of the things, though, is it starts with build. And so some people misuse that, and they just build first. And as I just got done saying, you can actually do a lot of testing and validation before you do any building. So actually, I have a modified version that I prefer that starts with hypothesize, because it starts out with what are our hypotheses. Let's design a way to test our hypotheses. Let's test them. Let's learn. And then we iterate, and we modify our hypotheses, and we go through that loop again. So it's a slightly modified version. So as we're um, going through the lean product process, we're iterating through this loop. right? Um, cool. So the first step of the process is determining your target customer. And by the way, I should say, that you can use this process, obviously, if you're building like a V1 product, you can use this process. You can also use it at the feature level. If you already have a product and you're adding a new feature, you can use it for the feature. You can also use it for a V2 product or a V3 product. You can also use it for a product that just you haven't used any of these techniques on. You're going to find ways to improve the product market fit. So it can be used in any of those contexts. But especially when you're working on a new V1 product, and it's like, OK, I've, Dan's telling me i got to figure out who my target customer is. I just want to acknowledge that. I know there's a lot of uncertainty. This is like the first, you're starting with a blank piece of paper, and it's like, who's my target customer? I don't really know. It's OK to start out with a rough tentative hypothesis, because steps one and two are so related that as you get clear and talk to customers and understand what the needs are, you're going to go back and revise your hypotheses in step one. So don't worry about getting it perfectly right the first time. Just start out with some guests, and we'll iterate from there, basically. But I want to show why it's so important to get clear on the target customer. And what happens, what I've found a lot that product teams and companies do is they talk about products and customers and needs at a very high superficial level. And it sounds good. It sounds good. In the meaning, it sounds good. But then you realize, oh, uh, it's not really actionable. And to achieve product market fit, you really got to kind of get detailed. And the analogy I like to use is an onion. You got to peel the onion, right? Um, I remember I was judging a competition at, at, uh, at an event. And you know, basically, there were these different startups. And I, would, I just went up to one of the startup teams. And I said, great, you know, hey, who's your target customer? I, I was basically just going down this list with them to see what they, what they were saying. And they said, oh, our target customer is millennials. And at first, I was like, OK, cool, millennials. That sounds good. But then I thought about it. I'm like, do you know how many millennials are out? There's like millions of millennials out there. So it sounds like specific, but it's really not specific. That's what I mean about staying at the superficial level. Um, their, food, their product had to do with preparing food at home. So I know there were other ways they could have further refined and narrowed down their target market besides just saying millennials. That's too vague. They should have said millennials who like to cook at home. That would have been way better, right? So that's what I mean by peeling the onion. And again, I don't expect you to be like five layers into the onion at the first iteration, but you'll get there eventually. But let me show you why it's so important. Let's talk about a need that's kind of like at that millennials level, uh, the transportation within 100 miles of my home. This is a need that a lot of us, probably everybody in this room has, to get to work, to get to school, to get to the store, whatever it is, right? It's a common need. And if we just talked about that superficial level, we would only get so far. But the second you say, you know what, we're trying to meet this need for a certain type of customer, then you realize that even though they, that, that target customer really makes a big difference, that even at the high level it's the same, but once you get more detailed, it's different. Let's talk about two different target customers, a soccer mom, and a speed demon. They both have that need for transportation, right? They both have that need. But if I went and interviewed 20 soccer moms and said, hey, can you tell me what's important to you when it comes to transportation? They might bring up things like, well, you know, I'm like carrying all my children and all their friends and all their sports gear, so the car's just got to be big enough to hold all that stuff. And they might say things like, well, you know, I'm driving my children around. They're very important, so safety is really on my mind. And I'm doing a lot of driving on the weekend, so I, you know, I'm thinking about how much money I'm spending on gas, so it would be great if the car was fuel efficient. Those might be examples of things that we say. So it's not instead of this, it's more like refining that, right? If we talk to 20 speed demons, they probably wouldn't bring up any of these things. They would bring up things like, well, it's important for me that the car goes really fast. It's important that the car looks cool. And more importantly, that I look cool when I'm driving down the street in my cool car, right? And you end up with very different products as a result. Both of these products 
help you with transportation within 100 miles of your home. But they've been optimized for that target market, right? And I love talking about the cars. Think of, I'm sure we have probably like 80, 90 people here. There's probably 50, 60 different types of cars you all drove here, right? There's so many different cars on the road. They've done a good job of tailoring the car to really meet the needs and preferences of the target market, right? <clears throat> and, um, and in the book, I get into how you know, using personas is a great way to capture these, your assumptions, right? Personas are usually, sometimes they're not used or they're used in the UX design phase. I think you can use it up front. Uh, as I mentioned in the book, some people had a bad experience with personas. My advice is don't blame the tool. It's probably the people that used it. You know, it's like if you get a persona, it's like, oh, this person's a Capricorn. They like long walks in the moonlight. That doesn't help you make product decisions, right? So people sometimes get a little creative and add stuff in that doesn't matter. And then everybody goes, oh, these personas suck. Let's not use personas. They're bad. Let's not do that. So they're actually fine. Just if, if you. What happens when you do like, um, like Facebook, right? It has a broad customer. Mm -hmm. So how do you then? So do cars, right? Cars do too. You have to like define multiple segments, right? You, you, so the point is not that you have only one. Over time, you might have multiple segments, right? I mean, even within Facebook, yeah, you've got young people, you've got old people, you've got a lot of different stuff. So yeah, and in B two B, you might have two. So I didn't mention this, but like you know, if you say you've got back to this pyramid, say your say your Airbnb, and you've got renters and you've got hosts. Well, guess what? You've got two pyramids because you've got two sets of target customers. If you're in B2B and you've got the buyer and you've got the user and you've got the admin, you've got three pyramids, right? The whole point is you need a pyramid for each one. So when you're in a broader offering like that, you need to get clear on who those are. And one of the books that I reference in my book is actually um, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum by Alan Cooper. So he's, he's a big proponent of uh, personas. And when I was, you know, realized how important UX design was, I discovered and read his book. So he has a lot of advice when you have multiple personas on how to deal with that and focus on like prioritizing them. So, yeah. So if you have you know multiple personas or uh, customers, you got to get clear on who they are. So once we have a tentative hypothesis on who our target customers, then we move on to step two, which is all right. Let's figure out what their underserved needs are. And when I like when I talk about needs, uh, a lot of teams don't talk about needs. They just talk about building features and things like that. And so an important concept here is what I call problem space versus solution space. Who, who's heard of problem space before here? Raise your hand. So a few people. So I've been talking about problem space since for a long, long time. And I'm excited to hear more and more people talking about it. But let me explain it, uh, why, explain the concept. You'll see, I think, why it's important. Problem space is basically a customer problem, a customer need, or a customer benefit that your product should address. And sometimes people get, like, picky about is it a need, is it a pain point, is it a benefit? It's all the same thing. It doesn't matter. It's like what value is it trying to provide for the customer, right? So a well-written product requirement would, would be in the problem space. A well-written agile user story, like as a blank, I want a blank so I can blank, that would be in the problem space, right? If I said, you know what, well, let's just keep going here. The solution space, in contrast, is a specific implementation that's meant to address that need or requirement. So say I was like, you know what? Uh, I want to um, make it easier for people to share photos with their friends. That statement, make it easier for people to share photos with their friends, that's in the problem space, right? It's, uh, that's what I'm trying to ma make people's life better um, by providing that customer benefit. If right after they said, and I know, yeah, last weekend I coded an iPhone app that does that, that app would be in the solution space. That's the difference between a, a need, customer need and, a, and, a, and an app. Or if I said, hey, my friend, you know, Bill, He's a designer, and he did some mock-ups for an app that helps it makes it easy to share photos with your friends. Those mock-ups would be in the solution space, right? So that's the difference. This is like, what are we trying to have it do for customers? And this is the actual implementation. Yeah? How do you feel about the old adage that product managers should be in the quote-unquote problem space, especially if it's a crossover with UX design? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't like it whenever anybody draws really crisp boundaries. To me, that usually belies other issues if people are having turf wars. So I think you should be clear on who's driving what, right? The logo for my meetup is a Venn diagram with product management, UX design, and dev. And I think that they should all be collaborating. Good I when I worked at Intuit, one of our operating values was good ideas come from everywhere. So, so yeah, if, if, if the designer has a mock-up and the PM says, oh, hey, I saw this cool drop-down on this other site. What do you think about that? That's not... Off bound, out of bounds. That, you know what I mean? Like, I, there used to be more of those discussions back in the day about it shouldn't say the what and should just specify the why and that kind of stuff. I mean, in general, I think it's good. Like, 
conversely, you could be that PM who's like, I spent all night doing the sketch thing. Here you go, UX designer. This is how you need to build it. You want to stay away from that. You want it to be a collaborative effort and just be clear on who's driving the bus at that point, right? And, and in general, I think in the beginning of the process, the product management is more driving it, figuring out what's the business opportunity, what's the market opportunity, who are the customers, what are their needs. At some point, more like what we would call the discovery and product definition phase, at some point you transition to the design phase. And it doesn't mean the product manager goes to involvement goes to zero or say goes to zero. It just means the baton gets passed to the designer. If you have one, that's the other thing. You may not even have a design resource on your team, right? So, but yeah, so I don't like when people draw, why are you doing that? It's, it's usually a, an in, a cultural indicator that there's a problem versus there's not enough collaboration going on. Um, yeah, so that's the difference between these two. And the example I like to use to illustrate this is when NASA was sending astronauts into space, they knew that the pens, the ballpoint pens we used on Earth wouldn't work because they rely on gravity, right? And there's no gravity in space. So it wasn't NASA. I just want to be crystal clear. It wasn't NASA because there's actually, if you Google it, you'll end up on some urban legend site that says this is all baloney. It wasn't NASA. But one of their contractors, Fisher, this guy Fisher, the head of the Fisher company, said, you know what? I think I can invent a pen that writes in space that doesn't need gravity. And he went off and he spent, he did it. NASA didn't ask him to. He decided to do it. And he spent a million dollars and he actually invented a space pen. So I have a space pen here. Um, oh, you got one too? All right, cool. So yeah. Um, they tell me it writes in space. I haven't verified it myself. If anyone works at, <laughs> if anyone works at NASA down there and you want to send me up there to prove it, that would be awesome. That would be cool. Um, faced with the same challenge, the Russians, when they were sending their astronauts into space, gave them pencils. <laughs> and you can actually get a Russian space pen. It's just a red pencil in a box poking fun at like, the whole space pen situation. Now, why do I bring this example up? I bring this example up not to make fun of, it wasn't NASA again, but not to make fun of the situation, but to illustrate some points that come up. One is, obviously, if these are both equally good at meeting the problem, then the one that didn't take a million dollars and all that time and effort is a better solution. It's higher ROI, right? That's just the, that's the obvious takeaway. The second thing is, you know, and I didn't say this, but many teams they just jump straight into solution space without even realizing it. Like we live in the solutions, that's where we live. We live in the solution space. Like human nature is to think in the solution space. So it's like a learned behavior to say, you know what, no, we need to separate solution from problem and get clear on what the problem is. It's a learned behavior. But even teams, you know, some, then what that means is you just start coding or you just start designing without even thinking about who's this for and what needs is it going to meet for them. That's what going right into solution space means, right? And your odds of building a successful product go way down if you do that, right? Um, but basically, even if you're like, okay, I get it, I get it, we're going to try to focus on the problem space, even when you try to focus on the problem space, it's really easy for some solution space to kind of creep in. And I call it solution pollution, basically, right? So when the guy said, hey, I think I can invent a pen that writes in space, and someone said, okay, that's your requirement, is a pen that writes in space, he had some solution pollution in his problem space, right? What was the pollution? Pen, yeah, a pen is a solution. So right, you know, right? It would have been better if you just said a way, just be vague, a way to write in space. It would have been better than saying a pen that writes in space. But we can even do better than that. We can, so in, in, in the Toyota production system in Lean Startup, there's the five whys technique where you say, well, why does that matter? Why is that important? Why, 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 right? To get at the underlying root cause. It's like, okay, a way to write in space. Why do astronauts need a way to write in space? Why do they need a way to write in space? Take notes, yeah. Like write down information, refer to it later. You know, do some calculations. Think, you know, there's a couple things like that, right? That would be a better saying, like, hey, they need a way to like write down information. You know, sorry, they need a way to like you know, you capture information and refer to it later, right? Just stay away from it all, right? That would be an even better way of articulating the requirement. And then maybe it has nothing to do with writing at all, and it's like some crazy Siri thing that we invent that you talk to it, you know, and then it's like, hey, sorry, Dave, I can't do that, right? So, Anyway, so that's why I mentioned that, those examples, right? And it, now it turns out that, um, you know, this thing, there's other requirements that I didn't focus on. I'm, thanks, nobody brought it up. Usually I have someone, someone in the audience like, well, actually, this thing burns in space, and that's not good, right? It's true, yeah. So everyone uses space pens, but that's why I share that example. All right, let's talk about more of a software ex example that's probably closer to what we're working on. So again, we have problem space on the left, solution space on the right. The idea is you want to map. You want to have clean, you want to start in the solution in the problem space, and you want to map and work your way to the solution space and map and say, okay, cool, this, this feature idea is going to solve this problem and this one's going to solve this problem, right? So I worked it into it, as I mentioned, on Quicken. Uh, another one of our big products is TurboTax. Has anyone here used TurboTax? Yeah? 
Exactly. Uncle Sam needs you to file, and it's an easy way to file. So it's a product, it's a solution, so it's in the solution space. It competes with another product in the solution space, tax cut. Right? So for those of you that use TurboTax, why, why, what value does it do for you? What's the customer benefit that you get from it? Saving time. Saving time. You need a lot of people here. Yeah? Assurance. Assurance, OK. Simpl simplicity, yeah. Error reduction. Error reduction, right. I know there's more TurboTax people in here. <laughs> uh, the IRS is right there. You better tell them you're using Turbo. Speed, all right. Self-service. Self -service. One more. Maximize tax return. Maximize tax return. So, so, save money. Save paper, saving the trees. All right, I love it. That's good. Huh? What's that? Be compliant. Follow the law. That's good. Yeah. So that's so. See, that's the thing about the problem space. I'm the PM for interpreter. I got to make sense of all that stuff you just said. How do I make sense of that? Forget about. It. Let's just code something and design something. It's way easier just design and code. That's the thing about problem space, right? People aren't computers. You're not going to give me the same ASCII string when I ask you why you use TurboTax. And why is that? Because one, you're you know, some people care about saving money, some people care about saving time, some people care about assurance. They're talking about fundamentally different benefits. Even the people that are talking about saving time, someone might say it's speedy, someone might say it's this. They use different words even when they're talking about the same thing. So that's what we as product people need to make sense. And frankly, that's one of the biggest unique contributions that product managers can make. We're not there to design the product, we're not there to build the product, we're there to define Who's this for, and how is it supposed to create value for them? And that's what the problem space is all about. Now, we want to peel the onion, but it's helpful to at least have some overall umbrella statement to know what the context of, right? And if I had to put some overall umbrella statement over here, it would be something like, hey, it helps me do my taxes, it helps me prepare my taxes, right? And all of the detailed things that you guys said would kind of live below that, and we want to make sense of that, right? The other person that really helped me appreciate this difference between problem space and solution space was the founder of Intuit, Scott Cook. He's a really smart guy. And when he'd be like giving a talk to a group of product managers like this, one of his favorite things to do would be like, who's the biggest competitor to TurboTax? And we would all be like eager beaver, raise our hands, so he would pick us and he'd, he'd pick you and he'd be like, it's tax cut. He's like, no, you're wrong, it's pen and paper because more Americans are doing their taxes with pen and paper than either of these software solutions back then. Right? So that's the other thing about getting clear in the problem space is it helps you really understand what are the true competitors and substitutes to meet that people are using to meet those needs right, that you're trying to address. And back to that pyramid, the bottom layer is the market, the top is the product. Right? Those market needs don't change that quickly. Whereas technology waves on the solution space, on the product, they come and go rapidly. Right? And the example I talk about in the book is the need, the, the customer desire to listen to music on the go. Start out with FM, the little FM transistor radios, and then we had Walkman, right? And then we had Discman, and then we had MP3 players, and then we had iPods, and then we had, we just use our phones now, right? So like five or six solution waves came and went, but that need to listen to music on the go didn't change, right? So that's the thing, is these things don't change as much, and these things change more. Now, as I mentioned, we want to peel the onion. We want to get clear on the problem space. And, and you guys brought up a lot of detailed things. I, I have some things here. Check my taxes. Someone said reduce errors, right? File my taxes for me. Instead of going and printing them out and having to go stand in line at the mail at the post office, I can just push a button. It can help you maximize your deductions and ask you questions and find ways to save you money. It can maybe analyze your return. These are just four examples. You guys brought up a lot of other ones, right? This is what you want to do. And this is actually the fun part what I call divergent thinking, you want to, for, for that umbrella context, hey, how, what are all the different ways, with your team, brainstorm, we're not saying we're going to do any of these, but what are all the different ways we could make someone's life better when it comes to doing their taxes, right? And over time, like, Intuit has some crazy stuff, like, hey, did you, oh, you have a refund coming, hey, do you want that now? Anyone use that, you know, you guys familiar with that? It's like, oh, you have a $2,000 refund, you know, for a little fee, we'll give that to you now, right? They, all these things over time that they keep adding, new and new ways to, you know, improve that value. So you want to peel the onion. There's the onion, just so we get the visual here. You want to not be it and peel it and peel it and peel it. And that's how you really add customer, create a lot of customer value and achieve part market fit. Um, as I mentioned, it's messy. You're going to hear a lot of different things from people. And it's your job to make sense of it. And the first thing you'll find 
is that there are clusters of related, they sound kind of the same. Like someone said something about convenience here, someone said something about speed here, someone said simple. Those all kind of sound somewhat related. How do I make sense of that? So you may, again, like say these three, these three benefits help me reduce prepare taxes, reduce my auto check my return. If we did the five, if we talked to the users, interviewed them, and asked them five why, they said, well, why is that valuable to you? Why is that valuable? Why, why do you like that? Why is that important, right? What we're doing is getting them to go from the very specific and get them to up level and get up to a higher level benefit. And it's like climbing a ladder. So we call it actually, I call it, it's called the benefit ladder, right? And you guys may all start out with these very detailed things, but if I did five whys, we'd start to see that, wow, even though I had 10 different answers, there's really only like three or four ladders that they all kind of ladder up to, right? If I did this, these would probably ladder up to some overall benefit of empowerment or confidence. And the narrative we might hear from people might go, well, you know, before, I'm just not good at math and not good with computers and, or not good, I'm done, the computer doesn't matter. I'm not good with math and I don't know anything about the tax law. Every year I have to file my tax returns. Those forms are so complicated. I have no idea what's going on. I'm bad with numbers. I'm probably making tons of mistakes. And then I use TurboTax and it's like completely different, right? Uh, it just holds my hand and walks me through, asks me some questions. Next thing you know, I filled, filled out my taxes. That might be uh, what we would hear about that kind of a benefit. There could be a completely separate, distinct benefit ladder about saving time. It has nothing to do with empowerment or confidence, and some of you guys mentioned save time. And then we could break it down and say, well, there's multiple ways that it saves you time, whether it's preparing or filing taxes, right? And there could be yet a third benefit ladder that's distinct about saving you money. And what we might find is that all or most of the features or most of the things that are in TurboTax eventually reach one of these three ladders. And maybe there's a fourth or fifth ladder, but these are the three of the key ladders that are there, right? That is basically what I call a problem space definition, and that's what you want to do before you start working on the solution space. Right? That's, that's your job as a product manager, is to figure that out. Right? And you'll notice this whole time I've been talking a lot about TurboTax without actually mentioning any features. I've been spending a lot of time talking about TurboTax in the problem space. And again, as I said, what you want to do is map. Start in the problem space and then say, OK, if we want to help people reduce your risk, what can we do for them? And brainstorm the solution ideas from there. It just so happens that TurboTax has a feature decked directly one-for-one -one mapping with each of these problems. And when you have that clear one-for-one -one mapping and you have a well-named feature, there's a benefit, a side benefit, that just by seeing the name of the feature, most people can figure out how it's going to make their life easier or create value for them, right? And hopefully you can see that looking here. All right, so if you take my advice and as a product manager with your team, brainstorm, what are all the different ways, what are all the different customer benefits we can do in the problem space to make people's life better within the context that we're operating? That's the divergent part where it's fun to brainstorm and create a lot of different options. The next thing is, great, Dan, now we have dozens of things that we could do for customers. We can't do them all. We have five developers. What do we do? So we need to prioritize now. Now it's time to converge and evaluate. Now it's time to bring in judgment and say, okay, which one of these do we think are underserved? This is where we're trying to say, now we're taking a pass at how, which ones are underserved that are going to create the biggest opportunity to create value. And the framework that I like using for this is importance versus satisfaction. Let me explain that framework. Basically, importance is for the need that we're talking about. How important is it to you, right? So if we just go back to TurboTax, saving time, saving money, and feeling confident. If I asked you to rate each of those on a scale of 1 to 10, you're going to give me different answers for each of those. And if I ask you, you're going to give me different answers, right? So some people will value. That's, the, how, that's what we mean by importance. And you can think about it two ways. One is, as I just mentioned, like a survey where you, you know, survey thousands of people with a numerical scale of like 1 to 10, and you get statistical significance, and you can come back and say, OK, this need is a 5 out of 10, and this one's a 7 out of 10. That's kind of the quantitative way. You can also just think about it as a thinking tool, low, medium, high. We have no information, just our guts. We as a team, what do we think? Low, medium, high. And you can just do a little team vote and figure it out. And you can do low, medium, high. So you don't get tripped up on, wow, how do I measure this very precisely? It's a very, it's, it can be used as a thinking tool. The other axis is how satisfied are people with how they're getting that need met today? All right, so this is in the problem space, and this is in the solution space. Again, we can say, hey, you know, how are you doing your taxes today? And on a scale of 1 to 10, how satisfied are you with that? All right, that would be what we would Or we could say as a team, hey, do we think people are like low, medium, high with how that need's getting met today, right? So let's divide this up in a quadrant so we can talk about the different parts of the, of the space. So in the bottom left, we have a user need that has low importance, and people have a low level of satisfaction with the current alternatives. Over here, we have a low importance user need and high satisfaction with current alternatives. 
At the end of the day, neither of these quadrants are worth going after with your time. Right? All other things being equal, why wouldn't you go for a high importance user need? Right? So people don't do this on purpose. They do this because they're not user centric. They start in the solution space. They don't talk to users. They don't get clear about the hypotheses. They don't test their hypotheses. They go and they launch this, and they think it's important. They launch it, and customers go, no, we don't really like that product. It's not important. In the upper right, we have a high importance of user needs, so that's better right, than low importance. But we also have high user satisfaction. So yeah, it's an important need, but people are pretty happy with how it's getting met today. That's the definition of a competitive market. right? Um, and I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't go after those markets, but when you go after those markets, um, especially if you have a smaller team and less resources, you better be crystal clear as how you're going to be better. And not just a little bit better. You hear people say you need to be 10x better. This is where you need to be 10x better. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but you've got to be really confident in how you're going to be 10x better. The first product I think of, the space that I think of up here is Google Internet Search. If I said to you, hey, how important is it to find the information you're looking for online? It'd be pretty important. But it's not like people walk around going, gosh, this Google thing, I can't find anything online. It just doesn't work, right? You may have to modify your query once or twice or go to page two, but you'll find what you're looking for eventually, right? So that's what I think about there. And it's funny because there's actually, we're all laughing, but there was a startup in 2008 that tried to take Google on an internet search, and I talk about that in the book. All right, in the last quadrant up here in the upper left, we have a high importance of user needs, so that's good. And we have a low satisfaction with what's out there today. This is where opportunities lie, right? So this is where, that's what underserved. The, the closer something is to this upper left corner, the more underserved it is. And these opportunities do exist. They probably don't exist forever because we live in a competitive environment. Other companies are trying to find unmet needs and address them and innovate, right? So these windows can open and close. But if you, you know, do the right type of customer discovery and think about things this way and analyze it, you can find opportunities. The, the one that comes to mind for me is the ride sharing market, right? Especially in the Bay Area. I used to live in the city. And if I said to you, let's just do it this way. How important is it to get to your flight at the airport on time? Pretty important, right? How important is it to get to your job interview on time? Pretty important. How's it important to get to your date on time? Whatever it is, it's pretty important most of the time to get where you need to be on time, right? So high importance. And, you know, not every cab, right? But this, the city, San Francisco, had a pretty bad, I used to call, you call a cab, hey, yeah, they'll be there in 20, 30 minutes. 40 minutes later, no word. Call back, oh, yeah, I don't know what happened. We'll send you another one. You know, it's like, so maybe they show up, maybe they show up late, who knows, right? So if you just said, hey, overall, think about your last 10 cab rides that you took on a scale of 1 to 10, how satisfied were you? Obviously, there are good cabbies and good experiences. I'm not saying they're all bad, but you can imagine it being low. And we could peel the onion one more layer. Instead of just asking for overall satisfaction, we could say, how satisfied were you with you know, the punctuality of when they arrived? How satisfied were you with the cleanliness of the car? How polite was the driver? You know, how safe did you feel? How easy was it to pay at the end of your ride? You can imagine low scores on a lot of those dimensions, right? And so those companies have done a lot of things right to get to the large size that they have, but that's, I think, a fundamental reason is that they were addressing an upper left quadrant need. And what I like about this framework is it's meant to be a visual framework. So what I'm trying to say, if there's a certain product that's represented by that red dot, and we plot it with what we're hearing from people saying the importance of the need that it addresses, and what we're hearing from people about how satisfied they are with how well it addresses that need, we plot it in that XY space, then basically what I'm trying to say is the area formed by where you plot it, that rectangle, is a proxy for how much customer value it creates. And if there's another product that addresses a higher importance need with a higher level of satisfaction, then it creates that much more value. Right? And when you see this important satisfaction this way, you realize that the opportunity to create customer value is just how much area is there to the right of where the market is. Where's the best product in the market that's meeting that need? Are they here? Are they here? And, and, and the more room there is to the right, the more area there is to the right of where the best product is, that's where the biggest opportunity. That's why the upper left quadrant offers the biggest opportunity. And if you have an existing product, say your green dot is your existing product, you can create more customer value by just improving the satisfaction with which it addresses the, the need that you're trying to address. Right? Now, if this seems kind of conceptual, abstract, theoretical, let me show you some real data. Um, and this is in the quantitative survey case where we, I was fortunate to have a lot of users that I could survey. We asked them to rate it numerically. So now instead of low, medium, high, um, actually for 13 of the key features in the product, we asked people to rate their importance and satisfaction. And now instead of low, medium, high, we have numbers going up to 100 and numbers going up to 100. And each of these dots is one of those 13 key features. 
right, plotted with its values that we, that we, 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 we heard from our users. Uh, and the number next to it is just the satisfaction number, so you can see it more easily. The first thing I saw as a product manager was this point up here. 100% importance, customers are telling us it's 100% importance, and they're telling us that they're 98% satisfied. That's pretty good. So I was excited. My second thought was, okay, I have a limited dev resource. I'm not going to spend any of my resources on that because it's already doing pretty good. Let's go find other things that are going to create more value. Right? We had a cloud of things here. We had this one down here. But this one is the one that's the most up and to the left, right? That's the one that offers the biggest opportunity to create customer value, so we, we focused on that. And I developed this framework while I was at Intuit, and then a few years after I left Intuit, I came across this great book by Tony Olwick called What Customers Want, and lo and behold, he had his own importance versus satisfaction framework, and so that made me excited, because I'm like, wow, I came up with this thing, and he came up with this thing, there must be something to this important satisfaction framework. And he actually gets really into um, defining it and getting quantitative in it. So if this idea of getting quantitative and rigorous about importance and satisfaction appeals to you, I would recommend checking out his book. He's also one of the co-creators of uh, Jobs to Be Done. And he has a new second book called Jobs to Be Done just came out last year. I actually hosted him at my meetup when the book came out. The video is online, so I recommend checking that out. So we want to basically use importance versus satisfaction to uh, identify which are the most underserved needs that we want to focus on. Yeah. Uh, just good market research. What's that? Yeah, you get a new survey writer. Yeah, I mean, it's basically like, you know, it's funny because as people want to get more and more customer centric and use either qualitative techniques of interviews or quantitative techniques of surveys, there's actually people that have PhDs in those things. And I was very fortunate into it that we had a PhD in market research on our team. So I learned that. So like everything else, there's best practices and mistakes to avoid. Um, you don't need to get a PhD in it. There are certainly books. I have a whole chapter in my book on user testing and how to conduct user testing well. Uh, I'm not a big fan of surveys because they get misused. It's so easy to misuse. If you, if you want to get a feature approved by management, I'll write the survey. I'll, I'll make people answer it in a way. I'll write the survey so that people answer it so it gets approved. You want to get it killed? I'll write it so it gets killed. I can do that. You can do that with the questions, right? So surveys are easy to misuse. Um, but the good news is conducting in-person interviews, there's only a few tips and hacks to learn and things to avoid. You can actually get pretty good at it. And, and so I have some good advice in the book about that. So there are other good books out there, too, that go really deep into how to conduct user research and things like that. Yeah? Uh, can you explain the importance of need uh, by you know, something more quantifiable as uh, frequency of need or frequency, frequency of usage? Much more that is another dimension. That's another dimension. It's not the same as importance. It's, 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 in, it's, it's an important thing to look at, too. And that kind of also, that will mainly also come in, um, it will come in also into your revenue model as well. Like, so I know people that have low frequency of usage, and it can be tough. So now, if you're an entrepreneur deciding which market to get into, you can use it. If you're a PM at a company, guess what? There's an organic frequency of use. You can try to drive it and increase it a little bit. You know what I mean? Like if you're TurboTax, how, how many times a year do you guys use TurboTax? Right? So that's why they, they're trying to find other ways. Hey, you know, do your tax planning with us so that you're not surprised. And do your quarterly payments with X. They're trying to get more. So in general, yeah. So, but you're, I agree. And yes, frequency of use is, a, is another good metric to look at and can be a proxy. Um, but it has less to do with the fundamental importance. Like, how important is it to file your taxes? Pretty, you're going to go to jail. They're going to come get you, right? So even though it's once a year, it's pretty important. How, how important is getting married, right? So, so frequency of use is not the same. Don't, don't conflate the two. But within two things that are equal importance, I would pick the one with higher frequency use just because you're going to have more interaction with the customer and more ways to monitor. You know what I mean? More share of mind. It's more about that. It usually comes into more into play when you're trying to monetize it. There's more perceived value often. But All right, cool. Um, yeah. It doesn't have to be one to one. Um, yeah, it doesn't have to be one to one. A couple things can happen. Let's go back. Let's talk about some anomalies. Okay, you want to have at least one. <laughs> okay. So what happens sometimes if if you go into a product where they were solution space focused and not customer focused, you find a couple things. One is you may find a feature 
that nobody in the company can explain what it does for customers and no one uses it. And it's like, why do we build it? Well, Dave, the engineer, thought it was cool, so he built it, right? So that's an orphan solution that you can get. That's one anomaly. The other is you can have an orphan problem where it's like, oh, geez, we all agree this is an important problem, but when we look at our product, there's nothing that actually addresses this problem. So that's where you get like zero mapping. Um, the reality is you may have multiple things that support, like you may have like two or three features. It's all about granularity too. Like I can break this feature into five chunks or I can all describe it as one clump. It's, so it just depends. But yeah, it wasn't meant to be only one. It's like at least one. For the ones that we that we want to bite off, yeah. For the ones that are going to be on our MVP, for the ones that we just went through. So this is, doesn't talk about prioritization yet, right? This is just saying, hey, but after we run the prioritization and say these are the ones that are underserved that we want to have in, yes, you have to have a solution. Otherwise, it doesn't provide the value, right? It doesn't solve the problem. That's exactly right, yeah. All right, cool. So once we've kind of gotten clear on our target customer and what their underserved customer needs are, the next step is to say, okay, out of those underserved needs, which ones are we really going to say our product, we're going to you know, kind of put our brand promise behind and say our product, our product does this for you, and here's how it does it better than the other competition. We don't want to launch a me too product, right? So this is what, that's your value proposition basically. And the framework that I like to use uh, to, to get clear on your value proposition is the Kano model. And so before I actually came out in Silicon Valley, I got a master's in industrial engineering where I studied lean manufacturing and quality, and I learned about the Kano model. So before I even got into software development stuff. But I think it's a great framework um, to think about uh, your value problem. Let me, let me walk through the framework. So on the horizontal axis, it's talking about how fully does the product or feature meet the need that we're talking about? From it doesn't meet it at all, like the product, the way we did it in the product doesn't meet the need at all, to wow, the product fully meets that need. I'm fully set, right? And then the y dimension, y axis is based on how much the product meets the need, how much customer satisfaction or dissatisfaction does it create? That's what it's all about. Now, if this sounds a little complicated, don't worry. It, it's really simple because Kano model breaks it down into one of three types of benefits or features. The first is a performance benefit, right? The more the product meets that need, the more customer satisfaction is created. The less it meets the need, the less customer satisfaction there is. Right? This is pretty straightforward, right? More is better, less is worse. If we were in the microprocessor business and our chip speed was 10% faster than the other guys, chip speed is like, you know, clock speed is a higher, is a performance benefit. Faster is better, right? Um, let's go back to cars. Say I was shopping for a car and there were two cars and they were pretty similar and it's similar features and things. And then I suddenly realized that one car had twice the fuel efficiency of the other car, right? All, all other things being equal, I'd pick the car that gets more miles per gallon because you know, fuel efficiency for most people, it's a performance benefit, right? So that's performance, more is better, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Um, the second one is a must have. Now having a must have doesn't actually make anybody happy. Right? That's what this means, hey, you fully met the must have. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing cartwheels or anything. But if you don't have it, I'm going to be unhappy. Right? That's the definition of a must-have. It's not what your executive team says, this is a must-have feature we need to have. That's not what it, This is the definition. Is the customers are telling you that if you have it, you better have it, or I'm going to be unhappy. And if you have it, that's great, but it doesn't, like, I, that's not enough. I need more than just a must-have, right? A must-have, that's a must-have. So you can think about like a table stakes or cost of entry or checklist feature. Sticking with cars, say I went in, you know, I was buying a new car, I went to the showroom, and I saw this car and I just loved the way that it looked, right? And then I read the little spec sheet on the window and I thought all the specs and features sounded great. And then I peeked inside and I realized, oh, it doesn't have any seatbelts. I wouldn't buy it because seatbelts, I'd be afraid of getting hurt or dying, right? So seatbelts are a must have for a car. But if car A has five seatbelts and car B has 100 seatbelts, I don't say car B is 20 times better than car A, right? Once you have one seatbelt per person, you're checked, you're checked off the list, right? The third category is delighters. So not having a delighter doesn't cause any problems because people don't expect it to be there. But having a delighter, right, the more it provides a delight, the more customers sat. We call this a wow feature, basically, right, or a delighter, right? Not today, but sticking with cars. When the first cars came out with GPS navigation, it was a delighter, right? Before that, people were getting lost or printing out their Google Maps or MapQuest on paper, you know, asking for directions, right? And then the first people that had GPS in their cars, they just put in the address where they're going and just changed how they got from point A to point B. 
But as we know, over time, more and more cars got GPS navigation. You know, TomTom uh, Tom, Tom and Garmin came out with their add-ons, and now we just all use our phones, right? So this is not a static picture. It evolves over time, right? So the needs and features migrate over time so that yesterday's delighters become today's performance features becomes tomorrow's must-haves. And the pace with which that happens depends on the level of competition and innovation in your space. Um, but basically what we want to do is use these three categories of must-have performance and delighter to categorize our needs and articulate how we're going to outperform and be better than the other products, right? So again, our value proposition is, hey, out of all those underserved benefits that we identify, which ones are we actually going to bite off and tackle and commit to, to solving? <clears throat> and how are we going to be better? And so the way we do this is for our product category, you create a table. And you list one per row each of the must-have benefits. And one per row each of the performance benefits. And one per row each of the delighter benefits, right? And I've kept it generic, so hopefully you can Picture what that might be for your space, right? Again, if it were in, if we were in the chip space, like you know, like clock speed would be a performance benefit, right? The next thing you want to do is create a column for each of your competitors, one column for each key competitor, and one for your product. That's the second step. The third step is you want to evaluate and score your competitors, right? And you know, it could be, again, it could be like, hey, if, if it's like some numerical measure like chip speed, you could put the numbers in there. But you could also just use low, medium, high, right? As long as you look across the row and say, oh, yeah, these guys are a lot better than these guys. These guys are a lot better. It can be low, medium, high, right? Um, and so in this case, for example, both of our key competitors have the must-haves. Competitor A is the best at performance benefit one. Competitor B is the best at performance benefit two. They're both so-so performance benefit three. And these guys have this delighter, right? This is the backdrop upon which we want to make an informed decision about our value prop, right? This is like the essence of product strategy. Basically, and I, very few teams go through this exercise. They just like start building. They go right into solution space and start building stuff. But, or even if they think about the customer or benefits, they don't get clear on how they're going to be different. Like the number of stories you, you hear about like some entrepreneur going to pitch a VC and, the v, and is like, hey, I'm going to build some cool photo sharing app. The guy's like, hold on a sec. Have you seen this before? You know, it's like, yeah. And it's OK. Now, again, it's not saying just because someone else has done it, you can't do it. But you've got to get clear on how you're going to be better or different, right? Um, and you know, it's super easy, human nature, to be like, all right, we're going to be the best at everything. Hi, 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 hi. Right? And I run workshops. I'm actually running a workshop tomorrow. And one of the cool things I would like to do is see, OK, like, how many teams had one high? Nobody has one high. How many teams had two highs? And there's a couple teams. How many had three? And then four. Like some teams have like four highs. I'm like, there's no way you can be the best at everything, right? You just don't have the resources. And it's also, it wouldn't be like a clear positioning in the marketplace, right? If you're just all over the place, right? And it's easy to say yes and high, right? But the definite one of my favorite definitions of strategy is it means saying no to something. That's what being strategic is really about, is saying we're not doing this, right? So you got to say no somewhere. So given this backdrop, we might go with something like this as our value prop. We might say, of course, we're going to have the must-have. We're going to you know, deliver some of performance benefit one, but we're not going to try to outperform competitor A. Uh, we're we're going to say no to performance benefit two. We're going to say no and not worry about that one. What we're going to try to do is be the best at performance benefit three. Maybe we've identified some market segment that really values that performance benefit, and that's what we're focused on. Or maybe we've come up with some unique solutions-based ideas or technologies that lead us to believe that we're going to be able to deliver higher levels of satisfaction for that need, right? And then we have our own delighter idea that we plan to do, right? What matters the most is what's called your unique differentiators. It's the performance benefits where you're going to be the best, usually one, maybe two, uh, and your unique delighters. That's what matters the most, right? And this is what we want to get clear on as we go into the next step of our MVP because if this is what our special sauce is and why we're going to be better, and then we go and do an MVP and it doesn't have either of these things in it, what the heck are we testing with our MVP? We're not testing must-haves. You're not going to win on must-haves, right? So that's what we want to get clear on. Um, and you know, just to kind of drive this point home a little bit, has anyone here heard or used Instagram before? Oh, cool. A few people, right? So what were there, not now, but when they first came, when they came out, you guys remember, there were tons of photo sharing apps when they came out. So why did they win? I think it's because of their value prop. So what was their unique differentiator? Does anyone have opinions? Filters. Filters is the first answer that I usually get. That is one of them, I believe. There's one other one. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, huh? Square, that, that is, that's, a, that's a second order one. I think it's a good one, too. It's, that way, 
So square pictures meant you didn't have to worry about portrait or landscape. Your picture always looked good no matter what was going on. I'd throw that in there as another one. There's one other one that I'm thinking of too. Yeah. Posting directly for the phone. Yeah, the way I would say it is faster uploads, right? All the other guys, you have to sit there and wait, nah, 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 but, and they, what they did, technically, they had a hack where they just started up, they, I think they had better compression, and they just started uploading it. Like, they didn't wait for you to push the upload button. They just said, of course, they're going to upload. Just upload the damn thing. Start doing it, right? So you gain like a second or so, and then, you, oh, wow, it's a second faster than all the other ones. So it was a combination of just that UX hack and some legitimate tech hacks. Yeah, yeah, right. So faster uploading, filters, and we'll throw in square pictures too. But let's let's just for simplicity one. Yeah. I would translate filters into making you like a photo pro. Okay. Yeah, that's the five whys. Like, why does that matter? Like, yeah, you look like a rock star with your friends, right? Right. So let's go back to this. So let's classify these things as either a must-have, a performance, or a delighter. But like um, reduced upload times. Is it a must-have, a performance, or a delighter? Who thinks it's performance? Raise your hand. OK. Who thinks it's delighter? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's a must-have? Raise your hand. It can't be a must-have, because the other people didn't have it. right? It's a performance. Anytime it's like faster, better, da 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 like a number, if you can measure it with a number, it's a performance benefit. right? right? These guys are 30% faster than the other. It takes five seconds on these guys' apps and one second on this app. That's a performance benefit, right? Yeah. Huh? It's just semantics of how you talk about it. If you have like a 10x of performance benefit, you could say, wow, it delights users, but that's not, it's not, if you go back to with this diagram, right, it's just more is better, less is worse. It's not like if you don't, if you didn't upload at all, would they say I'm good? So, but let's do this now. Let's do this. Filters, are they a must have performance or delighter? Delighter, yeah, right? It's kind of, that's why delighters are more like this yes, no binary. You either have it or you don't. It's not like, oh, well, you know, you could argue, hey, there's degrees of filters and how many filters do you have and quantify the quantity and quality. But I think at the end of the day, that was a delighter. And then how about square pictures? Performance must have delighter. Yeah, it's a tough one. I, I would say probably a delighter. It's kind of like a UX thing, like easier to use, maybe a delighter. I don't know. I mean, some people didn't like it. Like, why are you making my picture square? But anyway, so, but that combination of a performance benefit, it's like a one-two punch. A performance benefit and delighter comes up all the time. When you, if you start to look at things through the Kano model lens and the value prop lens, you realize, wow, they won because they outperformed on this and they had this cool delighter. So that's a very common one-two punch that you see. Instagram is a good example of that. OK, so once we get clear on our value prop, then we go to the next step, which is, OK, great. Now, what do we want? What feature set should we build? Now we're finally, the whole time, one, two, and three, we've been in the problem space. Now that we're clear on what's underserved, who we're, who we're, whose life we're trying to make better, what's underserved, and you know, how we're going to be better than the competition in meeting those needs, now we're going to say, great, now let's take those needs, and now let's do the mapping to the solution space. right? Um, and so, and again, we don't want to like, overbuild before we realize, gosh, we didn't go in the right direction, right? So we want to take an MVP approach, which is just to scope it just enough to figure out if we're going in the right direction or not. Um, so MVP is one of these terms. It's a buzzword, right? Um, what does MVP mean to you guys? Yeah, literally, it's minimum viable product. What does that mean to you, though? Yeah. OK, max value for minimum effort. Yes? Lowest cost to find out if the product makes sense. Yeah, lowest cost to find Product solves the problem. Product right. So yeah, so you know, these, you guys are all giving similar answers, but there are some like debates online about this kind of thing. So make money. Wow, you got to make money. She's all about the money over there. All right, all right. That's good. All right, cool. OK, yeah, so people have different. Huh? There you go. If it wasn't any less, exactly right. Cool. Yeah. So um, yeah. So MVP. It's funny because there's two mistakes I see teams make with MVP. Um, one is the whole point of an MVP is to avoid the old way of doing things, where you like, you know, you bit off way more scope before you launched and tested and saw if you're right or not. Right. So even though MVP is meant to like avoid over scoping your initial product people still overscope their MVP. 
And it's because it's human nature. It's like, oh, yeah, well, let's just be safe and put that in. Someone might complain because it's missing, right? So it's really easy to just say, oh, yeah, put that in and put that in and put that in. What that does is it just, it just delays the testing, and it just takes more time to get to the MVP point, right? And then if you realize you're wrong about some other stuff, then it's just you wasted that time. So it's tough. And look, it's tough. It's tough, it's tough to have the discipline and say, let's try it with this and not do it. So that's one mistake that I see. And it's almost like you need someone else. Like I have people that read my book, like Dan, love your book, totally get MVP. But here's why my MVP needs to have A, B, C, D, E, and F in it, right? And then you get some objective third party asking questions and going, do you really need that or not? And you can kind of get it. The second thing I see, way I see people misuse MVP, is usually from people that don't really understand it. it I like to explain with this framework. So it's another pyramid. It's actually, um, has anyone here used MailChimp before? Was it pretty easy to use? I remember when it came out, like it was so much easier to use than all the other email platforms at that point in time. So Aaron Walters was the head of UX design for MailChimp, so he knows a few things about UX design. And he has a book called Designing for Emotion where he has this framework. And the idea is <clears throat> we can talk about and evaluate a product and talk about how functional is the product, how reliable is the product, how usable is the product, how delightful is the product. And the idea is you kind of cut and color in how much you plan to accomplish at each phase, right? Um, and it's, it's what I love, he's trying to elevate the discussion to delight, right? About 15 years ago, people kind of had an awakening and realized, geez, wow, usability is really important, ease of use. Like, the usability answer is, can people use your product? Delight answers the question, do people want to use your product? How do they feel when you use your product? So that's where the conversation is going these days. And so, um, you know, obviously with our MVP, we're not going to build the whole pyramid. It's, it's not going to color in the whole pyramid when we do our MVP, and we're not going to color in all the functionality, right? Um, but people, the mistake I see people do is they use MVP as an excuse to do this. They build a subset of functionality. Like, hey, it's an MVP. We can't build all functionality. Cool. But they say, you know what? It's okay if it's buggy. It's just an MVP. It's okay. We'll do the UX design later. It's okay if it's hard to use. It's just an MVP, right? How do you think those test when you test it? They don't test well. It doesn't matter if you've got some cool feature. If people can't figure out how to use it or it doesn't work when they want to use it, you're not going to get credit for the functionality, right? So these things can get in the way of, of the value of the customer getting the value. So it's true that you only want to build a slice, right, with your MVP, but you want the slice to look more like this, right? So whatever subset of functionality you build, it's not going to be perfect, but it should be reliable enough and usable enough and delightful enough, right? Otherwise, going back to the value prop, what are we really testing? We, we want to test to see if our unique differentiators like, resonate with people and people agree that it's better than what else they've used. Right? So a lot of times I see people, you know, usually it's when they're trying, a team's trying to do a cultural transition to lean or agile, and they say, OK, let's do MVP, and they do this, and then they test it. It doesn't do well. They're like, oh, see, this whole thing doesn't work. Let's go back to waterfall and do it the old way. It's, you know, it's like, well, they didn't do the MVP right. Yeah? It's like a waterfall Agile, use a story. That seems like a vertical slice. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, you can build this in an agile way. I mean, it's, you can you can build that in an agile way, and just you know, and just if 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 the team says, hey, bugs don't matter, and UX doesn't matter, then they can do it. But yeah, so all right, so that's those are two mistakes. And in the book, I have a lot of advice on how to like map from problem to solution, how to break things down. They don't have time to get in today. All right, so once we get clear on that MVP feature set, the next step is to create a prototype. And this is where, you know, so going from step three to step four, we went from problem space to solution space. When we talk about our features, they're usually expressed as words, right? In Jira tickets or in a Google Doc or in Confluence, they're just words, right? Or PowerPoint. Now it's time to go from words to actual designs, right? We're in the solution space, but they're actual time to do designs. And we need to do designs for two reasons. One is just to figure out what the heck it's going to look like. But the other reason I'm a big proponent is, is to try to get a prototype so you can test it without doing any building or coding. Right? And so we're going from words to designs, which means it's time to apply UX design. And the way I like to think about UX design is as an iceberg. Because the thing about an iceberg is there's a portion of it that's visible above the water, but there's a lot underneath the water that you can't see. Right? When it comes to UX design, the part above the water that most people see and react to is visual design. Right? You guys are looking at my slides, taking in the fonts, the colors, the shapes. You're looking at me. We're all looking at each other. Right? We probably take in you know, 90 plus percent of our information through our eyes, maybe a little bit through our ears when we're listening, right? but mainly through our eyes. Right? But when you use a product, 
that it's easy to use and intuitive and you enjoy using, it's because the team has done a good job of these more foundational levels, levels that aren't that obvious, right? And those foundational levels are, you know, it starts out with a conceptual design, like what's the fundamental concept for how we're going to design the user interface here? The next level up is information architecture. That's how you organize and structure your, the, your application or product, right? If it's hard to find things, things aren't where you expect them to be, the labels don't make sense to you, then they've done a poor job there. If instead things are where you expect, it's just easy, you don't really think about how you're navigating and finding things, then they've done a good job. Interaction design is literally how the customer interacts with your product. Anything they can click or tap on, forms, controls, navigation, that's interaction design. So again, I don't have time to get into it, but I have a whole chapter on UX design because I think it's really important for product managers to learn about it. Um, I don't expect you to be world-class designers, but it's going to help you be partner better with your design partners and you know, give them feedback on the design, come up with ideas. So I think it's important. Now, when we're going from words to, to, to live products, so at some point, we've got to go from words in Jira or Google Doc or Confluence about what we're going to build in features. And we actually get to have to get to a live code and product. Uh, and we want to work our way through UX design. So there's a range of different design deliverables or artifacts that we can create. And what I'm going to share with you is a process that I recommend as a way to kind of work your way from words to live product going to UX design. And I like to categorize these deliverables by fidelity from low to high, which is like, OK, compared to the final product that we ship, how closely does the design artifact resemble it as far as like pixel perfection, right? And so low would mean it, it's a, like a crude sketch, and up here it would be like, hey, it's pretty close to being like the live product. On interactivity, this is the question of how much can I interact with it compared to the live product, the design deliverable, right, uh, or artifact. In the bottom left, low fidelity, low interactivity, we have the awesome hand sketch, whether it's on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard. This is like a good first step when you're going from words to sketches and designs. Um, for your team to work through and iterate you know, on a whiteboard until you get to the point where you're like, yeah, that looks like a good initial design. Um, the next level up in interactivity and fidelity is wireframes. Um, in the old workflow, they would be static wireframes, but these days the tools make it so easy to make clickable and tappable wireframes that if you're not doing clickable and tappable, just go learn how to do it. So there's no other way. When I interview PMs and I'm like, have you done wireframes? And they say, no, it's just like, it's, a, it's not a good sign. It's like, it's so easy. Has anyone here used Balsamic? Yeah, so Balsamic is like great for product managers. Like you don't need to be a designer. It's not Sketch, it's not Photoshop. It just makes it really easy. It's deliberately low fidelity, right? And back to that iceberg, you know, I've seen this happen a lot where, well, let's, oh, I'll come back to this point in a sec. But basically, clickable wireframes, tablet wireframes, you, you want to basically iterate until you are happy with that. And that actually is good enough to test with people. And I advise testing with people. The reason why is, yeah, it's not going to look like the final product, but back to our MVP discussion, say you did have the courage to not put features X, Y, and Z in there, and you go and you test this, that's when the customer is going to go, are you crazy? Where's feature X? I can't use this MVP without feature X. That's where you'll learn it. Like, it'd be great to learn that sooner rather than later, right? They're probably not going to complain about, why did you put feature B in there? I don't need feature B. They're not going to complain about extra stuff, but if anything critical is missing, they will tell you. This is also a great way to work through the information architecture issues and interaction design issues, right? Um, the next layer up of fidelity is mock-ups. Right? This is where now, OK, it is like Sketch or Photoshop. A designer is like make, going through and figuring out the fonts and the colors and all that jazz. That's where we go to high fidelity. And again, um, you know, the mock-ups are created in tools like Photoshop and Sketch. And then they export image files, right? But um, there are great applications that let you take those image files and actually create a clickable or tappable set of mockups or prototype. Has anyone here used InVision or familiar with that? But the cool thing about InVision is as a non-designer, non-technical person, you can get a list, you know, get, get a, you know, a folder of screen uh, designs or page designs and upload it to InVision and then you can go in and say, okay, I'm going to put a little hotspot rectangle around this button. And when they click that, then it's going to go to this screen. And I'm put, you can create all these little hotspots that navigate around. right? And you can't do every scenario or path, but you can do a, what we call the happy path, where you expect people to go down. So that's a very powerful way to get feedback without doing any coding. Because now it looks enough like the final product, and people can click around on it. right? The reason to start with wireframes, one of the reasons is back to the iceberg, is people cannot help but fixate on vision. Unless you're well trained, just like teasing apart solution and problem space, teasing apart visual design from information structure to interaction design, unless you're a trained designer, is very hard. I remember one of my companies that I was at, we brought in some prototypes for a new product to the CEO. And his first comment was, 
I don't like this color red that you guys are using. The first comment wasn't like, why did you pick these features? I don't think this feature should be here. This feature is missing. I don't like the layout. It was this red. People cannot help but fixate on visuals. So when you do wireframes, they're usually grayscale. You can't even argue. And we're not even saying what the color is yet. You can't pick that fight yet, right? Let's just talk about what's on the screen. What's the layout? Is there anything missing there? Are we using the right words for it? That kind of stuff. So that's why wireframes are a great way to just not let people fixate on the visual design. They're done in grayscale. You don't worry about fonts. You don't worry about And in fact, Balsamic's default mode, the lines aren't even straight. They're like these squiggly kind of sketchy lines to convey to you subconsciously, like, hey, this is like rough. It's a sketch, right? Um, definitely, this is a great place to test with users, and I, I recommend you know, talking to users in waves of five to eight, and then you pattern match the feedback that you get, you address those concerns, and then you test with another batch of five to eight. Once you get to, you know, however many iterations that takes to get to the point where people aren't really raising any questions or concerns with what you've built, and they start saying, wow, this is actually pretty cool, I can see using it, then you can proceed confidently to going to live product and investing the resources to code. And I do recommend that you test your live product because there's no, you know, there's no like database performance issues with a mock-up or browser compatibility issues with a mock-up. So you want to, and sometimes when you put something into the dev pipeline, it doesn't come out exactly the way that you specified it. So just test that, and then you're good to go. To make it crystal clear, this is a wireframe. You can't argue with me about the red or purple because there is no red or purple. It's just gray. You can't argue with me about the font because we haven't picked the font yet. You can't argue with me about the pictures. You have to focus on what's on the screen. Is that the right stuff on the screen? Is that the best layout? That kind of stuff, right? That's a wireframe. It's created in Balsamic. Here's a mock-up, higher fidelity of the exact same screen. That's the difference between a mock-up and a wireframe, right? Now you can say, oh, I don't like, why did you pick this orange? I don't like it. Blah, blah, blah. You can do all that, right? But you want to start out and get alignment here. Now they did pick the fonts and colors and things like that, right? So that's the difference. All right, the final step, we have our awesome prototype to go test with customers, and it's time to go test with customers. Going back to our thing, now we've worked our way all the way through the pyramid. We've got our UX prototype, and now we're going to close the loop and test with customers, right? And it's important, one of the key things I'll say here, I don't have time to get into it. I have a lot of tips in how to do this. But one is make sure you talk to the target customer you start out with. Don't just grab some random person off the street, you know, right? And just because it's like, no, that's not who the target customer is. So you need to make sure that they fit in your target customer. All right, I'm going to close out with a quick case study here. Uh, people have said it's helpful to see the process, an example of it applied end to end. So this is from a product called marketingreport.com. Um, my client was a startup CEO. They had an existing product that was in market, and he had an idea for a new product. And it was a very small team. It was me, the CEO, the VP of marketing, and a UI designer. And he wanted to see if there was a business opportunity here. And he had a very limited dev team. So he's the one that said, hey, we can't do any coding. I said, great, we're going to use prototypes and we'll do this. The idea was a marketing report. So does anyone here get junk mail? No? Raise your hand if you get junk mail. You guys are crazy. So you get junk mail, right? So direct mail is a nice way of saying junk mail, direct mail. Um, the idea is like, is like to provide a product that would help people control it. Like say I come home tonight and I go to my mailbox and there's a coupon for cat litter. Why did I get a coupon for cat litter? I got sent that coupon for cat litter because in some database, marketing database in the cloud somewhere, it thinks Dan Olson has a cat. That's why, right? So that was the idea is like that you would kind of be able to um, understand that data and control that data. It's very analogous to the credit industry, right? Not today, but like, you know, 25, 30 years ago, you'd apply for a loan or a credit card, you'd put in your social security number, and it'd go off into some black box, and it would look you up on your social security number and say, oh, yeah, he pays the bills on times, so you're approved, or no, no, he's, he's a risky credit risk. No, you're And you would have no idea why. But over time, we had credit reports and credit scores, and you can go and say, oh, actually, that's wrong, and you can fix it, right, things like that. That was the idea with the marketing. It was very analogous to the credit report. I said, okay, sounds good. Let's and by the way, the target customer is like everybody who gets junk mail. So it's a broad consumer offering. That's step one is target customer. I said, great, let's talk about the customer benefits that we want to focus on. The, the best uh, explanation of the benefit was basically learn why I received the junk mail I received. That was the benefit. That the core benefit was that. Learn why I received the junk mail I received. That's the problem space. The top solution space idea was a marketing report, which would be like a credit report. It would have a profile of like all the data, oh, you have a cat, you have kids, you're married, this kind of stuff, right? That they would be using to target offers to you. 
and then a marketing score, which was meant to be like a numerical score comparable to a credit score. So that was the core idea. And then one of the executives said, hey, in addition to that core idea, uh, I'd like to also test the idea of money saving offers. Maybe, maybe I get the cat coupon, I don't have a cat, but can I, like, can I raise my hand and say, hey, I actually have a dog? It'd be great if you could send me dog related coupons like for dog food. So can I opt in for relevant money saving offers? That was, he wanted to test that. Um, he had a hypothesis that people might want to compare their shopping and spending habits and patterns with other people. Am I spending more on dog food than everybody else or not? You know? And then because social networking was hot at the time, social networking. Just pure solution space, just put the feature in there, right? It wasn't even clear why, right? It's just, okay, sure. The other executive didn't care about any of these things. He cared mainly about that main benefit, but then he also wanted to test the secondary idea of, well, what if we just help people like reduce the overall junk mail that they get? And then we said back to someone else, hey, you know, what you said earlier is like, hey, if we're like saving all this paper, maybe we can make some like green benefit save trees. So we iterated and got to this point. I said, okay, is everyone's idea on the whiteboard? And they said, yes. I said, okay, now great. Time to look, now it's time to go to the next step, MVP. Um, this is way too big for a single MVP. This is too much stuff. So what I did is I actually created two MVPs. So this is where we basically took two feature sets and two sets of prototypes. So uh, what I did is I took the core green stuff plus the yellow stuff, and we called that the marketing shield concept because it was like shielding you from junk mail. Right? And because the green stuff was the most important, we took the green stuff plus the blue stuff and created a marketing saver concept because it was trying to save you money. Right? So the, this MVP had these features, this MVP had these features, and we created two sets of prototypes. They look pretty similar. The look and feel was pretty similar, right? Here's an example. Next step is create your UX prototype. Here's an example of like the main page. I'd call this medium fidelity. You know, it has some colors, it has some logos, but we didn't obsess about making it look perfect or anything like that, right? Medium fidelity enough to get feedback on. And then when you clicked in, this was the page you clicked in on. Each of the key feature, each of the features was like one of these boxes. It had like an overview, and then when you clicked on learn more, that's when you went to the full page that had everything about that feature. So that's how we avoided doing two completely different UI designs. We just mixed and matched those boxes. If you were in the saver concept, you got the saver boxes, the boxes for the saver features, or if you're in the shield, you got the boxes for the shield. So I moderated people through the clickable prototypes. What did we learn? Here's that same diagram, now color-coded red, yellow, green. Um, I should mention, like, throughout the interviews, there were tons of questions and concerns and comments, right? No one was really excited about this. So green doesn't mean, like, oh, yeah, they were ready to buy this and go for it. Green meant we feel like we have a good handle on the questions and concerns that were raised and that we can address them and that behind there, there's enough potential to create customer value that, that we think it's worth, potentially worth pursuing. If we, if we pursued it, there would be some customer value there. Yeah? We did, you're right. We didn't go through that. Yeah, we basically, we could talk about it, but we could go through that. Yeah, we did. I skipped that. Good catch. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and you can talk about that. I mean, basically, like, and we'll get to that in a sec as we evaluate it. So green meant that, you know, hey, uh, that, that was basically what green meant. Um, and, the, and yellow meant that there was kind of like low appeal, wasn't really exciting for people. And red meant like they were just confused or didn't like it at all, right? So the number one thing is, is there any green? There's no guarantee that you're going to have any green, especially the first time you run it. So luckily, there was some green. We had some green here, some green here. The second thing is, was any of the green in the core idea that we were testing out? No. So it's like, thank god we tested something else. And this happens all the time. You go out to the market and customers with a hypothesis that you think, this is a big problem one of the solves for you. And you talk to them and they go, actually, eh, I don't really care about that. Like, but let me tell you about this other thing, right? Sometimes they guide you, sometimes you pick up on it, right? That's called basically like a pivot. Happens all the time. Does anyone here use Slack? Slack did not start out as a chat platform. Slack started out as a gaming company and they were working remotely and they developed the Slack tool so that they collaborate effectively and the game didn't really go anywhere. And all of a sudden they said, hey, this is a great collaboration platform, so that's what it did. Flickr, same thing. It didn't start out as a photo site. So it happens all the time. So there's a lot of value just getting in market and talking to customers with your initial hypotheses so that they can then guide you, hopefully, in, in, a, in a better direction. Um, the second thing is, so there's no green in the core area. The other thing is the red. I'm just as proud and happy about the red, right? Do you guys know what a marketing score is? No? I don't either. We didn't define what it was, but I know it would have taken uh, 
it would have required us to sign up for an expensive third-party data feed because we didn't have the data. Like, we don't have any data on you. We have to sign that up. It would take a lot of engineering effort to design some algorithm and come up with some crazy score thing and write all that code. And it would take a lot of time and money to educate customers about what the heck a marketing score is. But guess what? Low value, low importance, we don't have to waste any of those resources. So red is just as helpful as finding green. And you talk, you know, hear people say pivot. We started here, and we decided, are we going to pivot here? We're we going to pivot here, right? And this is where it kind of came back more to the value prop and, value prop and competitive analysis. Um, we went here for a few reasons. One is the company had an existing product, as I mentioned, and this was more consistent with their brand. Um, this, for money-saving offers, would have required a lot of time to do a bunch of biz dev deals and partnerships, so our time to market would have got pushed out. The other thing is that we're back to the competitive analysis. There are already people doing this, and back to the value prop, we couldn't think about how we were going to be better or different than anybody else here. So for those reasons, we pivoted to reduce junk mail. And because we had done zero coding, we didn't shed a single teardrop or get upset about just throwing away those old prototypes and starting from scratch with a blank sheet of paper. Right? And so what we did is we said, great, I had like six pages of notes from the uh, Marketing Shield concept interviews, and we just made sure that the new prototype addressed every single comment and concern that we heard. Right? So we pivoted to junk mail freeze. Here's the new mock-up. Right? Marketingreport.com completely gone. Because you know, again, we didn't code. When you code, it's like, well, John worked really hard on that stuff. Can't we salvage that somehow? You get emotions attached to it. Also, as a technical person, it's like, well, they start building their data models and their APIs, and it like, starts to put constraints on what you can do. It's like, oh, we can't do that because we built the database this way. It's like, okay, well, so anyway. Um, but it's just also like peeling an onion, too. Like, well, I learned all kinds of things. I learned in talking to customers that not all junk mail is uh, equally annoying. I learned there's some part, types of junk mail that really annoy people and piss them off. And it's the financial related junk mails. Right? I didn't know that going in. People told me, like, uh, oh yeah, I get these cash advance checks and pre-approved credit card offers. I hate those things. I'm like, well, why? Like, well, I live in a house. My mailbox isn't locked. I'm afraid somebody can go in there and grab those things and take money from my account or like do identity theft or something. So once we learned that, we put that front and center. The second time around, when we tested with the second group of people, they would hone in right there and you could see them kind of nodding their head and like their temple kind of, their veins starting to go because they're thinking about it getting upset, right? Other things I didn't know about, and, you know, and before I jump into the prototypes, I always do like some amount of discovery and just ask some questions. Like, hey, tell me about junk, what you do with your junk mail. With your mail. And they're like, oh, here, let me tell you, Dan. Here's what I do. Every day I come home from work, I go to my post, I go to my mailbox, I grab the sack of mail, I go straight to my shredder, and I go shred, 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 shred. Does anyone here do that? I didn't do that, so I didn't know, right? But these guys do this. I'm like, wow, how many minutes do you spend shredding? Like, Probably about five minutes a day. I'm like, the mail comes six days. That's 30 minutes a week. That's 1,500 minutes a year. There was a whole save time benefit that we didn't even have in our problem space map. Right? So that's peeling the onion and finding some new benefit. So we put that right here. Hey, spend less time shredding mail. So then the next round of people saw that and said, okay, that sounds cool. Little silly things. We had like, you know, save trees up here. Multiple people said, well, how many trees are you going to save? So we put 43 trees right there. So <laughs> I just knew it, right? So again, we just made sure it answered all the questions. And the second time around, the second time around, <laughs> there were still some questions and comments. It wasn't perfect. But there were a lot fewer questions, and the magnitude was a lot less. And both times I asked people, I didn't mention this, but we said, hey, would you pay 10 bucks a month for this service? We asked both times. First time, nobody had any interest in doing that. And it's always a little iffy if you ask people. They don't have to actually pay you 10 bucks or bust out their credit card. You know, what people say they're going to do and what they do, you've got to be careful with. But the second time around, what we heard pretty much everybody say is, hey, look, I need a 30-day trial. But if your product does what it says, I would gladly pay you 10 bucks a month. So it was like night and day from the previous round. And then the other cool thing that gave me confidence was after the test was done, you know, we paid people for their time to come in and talk to us for an hour. We're like, all right, here's your check. Thank you so much, John, for coming in. Almost every single person, the second group was like, so is this product live now? Can, can I go use this thing? We're like, no, nah, we're still working on it. It's not quite ready. They're like, can I give you my email? Will you contact me when it's live? Because I want to, they, 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 no one was doing that the first time around. So that gave me even more evidence that we had kind of iterated and improved product market fit. So I was pretty excited about that. <laughs> All right, so sum up the lean product process. You know, you want to start out by getting clear on who your customer is. Um, you know, use importance and satisfaction to identify which of their needs are underserved. Um, use the Kano model to get clear on how you're going to be better and different than the competition. 
you don't want to overbuild before you realize you're going in the wrong direction. So figuring out what your MVP feature set's going to be, um, using UX design to create a prototype so you can get out and test with customers with the goal of iterating through that loop, that hypothesized design test learn loop that I mentioned with the goal of improving product market fit. So that's the lean product process. Um, I mentioned that I run a meetup group. Our next meetup is actually on December 12th at Intuit in Mountain View. Um, our speaker is going to be Gib Biddle. He used to be the head of product at Netflix back in the day, a very talented product person. He's actually spoken at my meetup before. And his talk is going to be about how to translate product strategy and execution. A lot of companies struggle with product strategy, or if they have a product strategy, they struggle with you know, how to you know, actually execute on it. So that's what he's going to be talking about. So if you can make it, um, it's like 20 bucks, and we serve a meal. It's pretty pretty good crowd. We should get about 100, 150 people to come. It's an into it, so it's good. Um, and then I'm actually, if anyone's interested, tomorrow in San Francisco, I'm running an all-day workshop. So if you like the content we talked about today and you happen to be free, basically go really deep um, with a lot of group exercises where we pretty much cover the whole book in a day. Um, and I have a special 20% code for the product school um, folks. So anyone here in the room can use that. So if you're interested, you know, take a picture or come talk to me if you have any questions about it. So, um, And I know we did some questions during the talk, but I'm happy to stick around for a little while and do more questions. Get, a, get your tweets in if you want a chance to read the book. We'll do some questions, and then we'll break, and I'll uh, figure see who got the book, and then I'm happy to stick around for some more questions. Um, and then here's, again, my contact info. I put my slides. There are other videos of other talks that I've given at danolson.com. That's the meetup URL. There's that. And I'm happy to connect with folks on LinkedIn. Um, just don't spam me if we connect, but I'm happy to connect. Um, and with that, happy to answer any questions you guys have. Yeah, yeah. Dan, we promise not to spend if you pay 10 bucks a month. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Nice. Nice. <laughs> After you link in, you can unlink with somebody. So, yeah. Yeah. What is the best way to go back to product mapping when you don't have an existing product or a product not digital? You, like in, in, in Turbo Tax scenario, yeah. The key, what most people do when they do a competitive analysis is they use features. If you notice in my table, I wasn't using features, I was using benefits. So even like compared to say paper, pen and paper, you can do apples and oranges. That's the thing about the market, the needs. Again, remember the, the music, portable music example I said, right? The, the desire to listen to music on the go is the same even though there's different products, right? So um, TurboTax and pen and paper, you could say, like, how long does it take to complete, right? And one is, like, two days, and one is, like, eight hours, right? You can quantify it. You can say, like, you know, how likely are you to make a mistake, right? With TurboTax, it's pretty unlikely. With pen and paper by hand, it's pretty likely. So there are ways to articulate why TurboTax is better than pen and paper. There's, there better be ways. That, you know, obviously, it's better because more and more people have been adopting it over time. So the key is, when you do your value prop grid, is to make the rows be benefits, not features. To be in the problem space, not solution space. And what happens all the time is you just see, and your sales team comes in or somebody comes in, it's like, they have feature X. We got to build feature X, right? That's being solution space centric, right? And the assumption is, well, feature X solves an important problem for customers. And that other company that built that is so smart that they figured that all out. And let's just copy them. And the, but they probably didn't. They probably don't know why. And you can probably build a better feature that meets that need better than they did. So just don't copy for the sake of copying. Understand what the underlying problem is, and then you can probably come up with a better way. I do that all the time with my clients. We'll see someone, a competitor, who's clearly trying to address the same need. They do it a certain way. And there's some good things about how they do it, but we find ways to make it even better. So, Yeah. Talk about what? You, you mentioned about shield concept and like, concept or something. The shield and saver concept? Yeah. Oh, yeah, all it was is just, like I said, is, is two MVPs instead of one. It's a little more complicated. But basically, we just, we took, we took this, we took these benefits and these features and said, OK, with this shield MVP, MVP one, we're going to address those things. And to test these other ideas, we're going to create a separate MVP, MVP2, 
that has these things and these things. That's all. Just two, two sets of functionality, and then we created two sets of prototypes from that, and we got feedback on each of those. Yeah, that's right there. That's what we're testing. Those are the one, two, three, four, five, six. This MVP was testing those six things. This MVP was testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, those seven things. So they were both testing these four was in both of them. I mean, usually you just want to have one MVP. It's just it was kind of complicated what they did, right? So we could have just said, you know what, let's just start out. Let's pick one and do that. But because we're doing prototypes, we could do it all very quickly. So yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Sometimes product market fit and definition, especially when you're a startup, it turns out to be conversion. I mean, like there's a lot of metrics you can measure in order to know that you got the product market fit. But somehow with this process. You're getting evidence to support, to give you a reason, to give you confidence right. that what you're about to build has product market fit. Right? Yeah. And um, I didn't really, did I mention A-B testing at all as a tool? It's hot and sexy right now, right? Why the hell didn't I mention A-B testing right? Because what I feel like when you're building a new product, it's really about understanding the users in the problem space, and it's not about A-B testing. Um, the other talk that I give is, OK, once you do this and you launch your product and you want to see where you're at with product market fit and you want to optimize it, it's all about analytics. And so there's two chapters in the books on that, and I have another talk on that. Um, and it actually turns out that there's really only one metric that tells you about product market fit. Conversion doesn't tell you. Conversion is can indicate that you know how to talk about your product, but I can write a really slick landing page that sells you snake oil on this thing. And then you go, wow, that sounds great. And you click and you convert, but then you get inside, you realize, oh my gosh, this product sucks. It doesn't do anything. And you don't come back. Retention? Yeah, retention is the measure. And if you look at my book and you look at the talk, show, I get very detailed and specific about retention rate and how to measure anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. How many people do you talk to? These, I think the first wave was maybe maybe 20. And I can't remember if it, it wasn't 20 per. It was like 22 total. Maybe like 10, 10 or 11 per. Yeah, I recommend five to eight. Yeah, yeah. What happens is, and so, yeah, that's, so what we're kind of getting at here is like the, wow, Dan, you only talked to five to eight people. How do you know the statistics significant? And then the other, you know, the other the people like, yeah, you know, so that, that, that gets into it. But, um, what happens is as you talk to five, you know, six, seven, eight, you'll, like your discovery rate of new issues goes down. Like you're just hearing more of the same thing, right? So that's the real measure is like, hey, as long as you keep hearing new problems and issues you didn't know about, then keep interviewing, right? But what will happen is you usually about five to eight, if you've done a good job. Now, you may have noisy data because you didn't do a good job on having a cohesive target customer definition. And you realize, wow, we actually have three different populations of target users, so we're getting three different answers. And you need to revise that. Once you get down to a true cohesive target customer, then you're going to see around like five to eight, you're going to see like, you know, you've identified those. Yeah. And then what happens is you need to like remove those problems to get to the next layer of problems, right? Right. And the funny thing about this, so I actually did this when I did my startup. Um, and I did like 80 one on one user tests while we were in private beta before we launched a TechCrunch. And so when we launched a TechCrunch, they have like the judge panel on there. Marissa Meyer was one of the judges. She was at Google at the time. And she complimented her UI. And it's because we had done all this user testing, right? But when I first did the first set of user tests, you know, there were usability issues. And people weren't quite sure what to do. And so they said, you know, so we learned those things. The funny thing about that is when we fix those issues and then we test it with the next set of users, they didn't know what the old UI looked like. So they didn't go, hey, Dan, good job fixing those UI issues. They just didn't make the same complaints that the previous people did. So you get this weird progress where it's just the lack of the complaints you used to get represents progress. And starting to get new compliments represents progress. So, Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
imagine you start up new effort and you design a unique, unique company around. Can you apply the same role, uh, same model to discover when they? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, basically, I talk about this in the introduction to the book. Like, to have a successful product, you know, you need to have what I'm calling product market fit. You need to have a big enough market, right? Say I do this, and I'm like, wow, this, these people loved it, but there's 10 of them in the whole world. <laughs> I have a market size problem then. I've achieved product market fit, but my market is small, right? The other thing is maybe people are only willing to pay a buck, unit economics, a buck for this product, and it's like, gosh, it's gonna cost me five to produce it, right? So you actually need not only product market fit, you need to basically have favorable unit economics, you need to have a big enough market size, and you need to be able to like reach those people in a cost-effective way. So you need actually all four of those things. I'm not saying those other things aren't important. My book focuses on what is typically the biggest risk is achieving product, in my mind, product market fit. If you feel, there's also a fifth risk, which is technical risk, potentially, right? And if that's the biggest risk, then don't even waste your time on this. Like, just see if you can even do it technically, because if you can't do it technically, it doesn't matter. So what you need to do is figure out what's the biggest risk and assess that enough. And so what I recommend um, on the unit economics is just some kind of high-level spreadsheet back of the envelope. It's like, how much do we think we're going to make per user? How much do we think it's going to cost? And how many users do we need to get to for break-even kind of a thing? A simple analysis like that. Well, right is all relative. You're going to start out, it's going to be iterative. You're going to start out with some initial guesses, right? You don't know what people are going to pay you, but you can just say, hey, I think we can get nine bucks and it's going to cost us seven bucks and our fixed cost is this and our variable cost is this. So what you can do is you can say, I think based on these numbers, we need a million users to break even. And then you go to your marketing plan and say, okay, what's our marketing plan to get a million users? That's where it all starts to fall apart. I, I've helped with startups with this all the time. You're like, oh my gosh, this isn't going to work out. So it's good to know that sooner rather than later, just like it's good to know the feature set you picked or the UI design you did isn't going to work out. So you just got to decide what the biggest risk is. My book helps you mitigate the product market fit risk, not the technical risk, not the business risk per se. Yes? Mm -hmm. No, no, it's, it's also iterative. It starts out very like a sketch. It's just like a, a UX design. It starts out with you know, a couple of salient attributes that you think matter. And as you talk to people, you'll learn more things and cross out ones that are wrong and add additional ones and be more clear and realize, oh my gosh, turns out not all SMB people are the same. We need to create two now. There's this kind of SMB person, this kind of SMB. Yeah, so it's perfectly fine for them to start out low fidelity and get more more detailed as you peel the onion and learn more. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, people call that a proto persona, just to make it like acknowledge that it's okay for it to be minimalistic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually going to say that you said a concept that just comes up called provisional persona. It's, it's, it's kind of uh, the admission that it's something kind of traditional persona that you can build stuff that's kind of kind of a farce. Yeah, that, and in my mind, that's what I was saying early on. It's like personas, it's easy for people to misuse them. And, ex, you know, like enthusiastic designers to add all kinds of stuff that isn't based on evidence. It's pure conjecture and actually isn't even relevant to making product decisions. So I guess as you're building a persona, you should be saying, like, okay, I'm about to add this attribute. You know, what evidence do I have to support this attribute? Or not, or acknowledge you don't. Just say, hey, we have a high degree of uncertainty. This is purely a hypothesis. And secondly, say, would we actually, would this actually help us make a product decision or not, right? So you don't end up putting in their, high, their, their, uh, their you know, astrological sign because it doesn't really matter, right? Unless you're building an astrological product, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff. Um, on MVP, there's, there's a lot of debate in the industry on the risky Yes. Um, in my company, we use a different term called MBA, minimum viable audience. There's so many. Three letter variants of M something something. MLP, minimal lovable product. And yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, it's, I, I, I hate to say, you know, I, I've seen minimally lovable product, maximally lovable product, minimal sellable product, MSP, minimal viable feature, minimal sellable feature. It, it, it's like, 
I, I think that it's kind of like the persona thing. It's like people are pointing at MVP being misused and saying, that's dumb, this is better. It's just being misused in my mind. People don't really get it. So, uh, or if they want to emphasize a certain attribute, like if they feel like their organization isn't doing enough delight. But usually I've found that it's people don't truly understand the essence of MVP. And, and maybe some people in the org do, but not enough people do. And why would they, right? If, they, if you've never been in an organization that's done MVP successfully, why would you know, oh, that's how we do it? And there's a lot of judgment involved, so it's, it's hard. So. We also see a dichotomy between minimum viable product and the aspiration to win the market and be number one. No, because it's a misunderstanding. We're going to get there eventually. This is not the end of the race. The race is not over with your MVP. It's the start of the race. You want to make sure you're running in the right direction before you really start running fast. That's what it's all about. It's like directional. I would view it more as like you're picking a direction. Does that make sense? Like it's no one's saying you're going to win in the marketplace with an MVP. And so that's, it's just, it's really about risk and uncertainty mitigation. That's all it's about. So, yeah. And some people, you know, there's a quote uh, by Reid Hoffman. It's like, if if you're not embarrassed by your beta when you launch it, then you waited too long. So some people just have, they can't get over this perfectionist mentality of we can't launch it yet, it's not good enough yet, yada, yada, yada. Um, you know, I would just say a lot of successful companies, now obviously you can't throw out a piece of junk. I mean, it can't be junky. That's why I showed that diagram. That's why I showed that pyramid that I showed, right? That's why I showed this pyramid. Uh, this pyramid, right? That's why I showed this pyramid. Can't be junky. But some people try to bite off like half the pyramid with their MVP, right? But what you're saying is someone's saying, you know what, no, no, we need more features. No, no, it's got to be better. No, 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 no. You can convince yourself that you got to build the whole thing before you can launch it, right? So it's, and, and it's tough. It's tough to figure out what's enough versus not enough, right? Um, and some of the tools that you can use is like a private beta is a way that you can kind of get feedback without having it be out in the market so people go, oh my gosh, look at that product, right? Um, the app stores actually make it a little, they used to be tough because you, you launch in the app store with the substandard product and you get reviews and those reviews never go away. On the app store, you, <laughs> day one you get a review, it never goes away, right? So that's why there's like... The way to work around it is that you launch it straight. Well, that's one way. There's also, they acquired test flight. There's, there's test flight. There's a lot of ways to do it. So the whole point is, you. There's a perception of risk that isn't truly there if you get creative about how to mitigate the risk of, of the perception of your product. And, and truly, it's all about just getting early feedback and coming up with creative ways to do it. So that's what I would say. Yeah? So what are your recommendations on presenting MVP scope to you, especially for like higher levels like companies? I think the number one thing is to illustrate the trade-offs. It's like, yeah, we can wait, but that's going to add three months. And that's three more months before we know whether we're going in the right direction or not. That's three more months that our competitors are going to be <laughs> building features. So if, this is the easy thing. I and mean, I do this when the workshop tomorrow. I do this MVP exercise, and there's a fo there's a feature that everybody, most people in the room, like want to be in the MVP. And the reality is, it doesn't really need to be in the MVP, but everybody wants it to be in the MVP. So I go, who wants it in the MVP? And everyone raised their hand. And I'm like, great. Uh, engineering said it's going to add four months to our schedule. Who wants it now? Like, so there's no, if there's no trade-off, then why not? Sure, give me all the pie and dessert in the world. There's no trade-off. There's no trade-off. Like, so yeah, the key number one trick is trade-off. Is to make the trade-offs transparent. So we can do that, but it's going to reduce our time to market by this. And by the way, by our engineering, our engineering team working on that stuff, here's what's going to get delayed. The other stuff in the queue is going to get delayed. So that's the, the trade-off discussion. The other thing you can do is try to get out of that cycle and say, why don't we test the wireframe without it and see if anybody complains? You have a hypothesis that we need feature X in there. Why don't we test that hypothesis by not having feature X in this prototype and see if anybody complains? Right? That's, so instead of arguing about, no, you're wrong, I'm right, elevate the discussion to, you have a hypothesis that X is true, I have a hypothesis that X is false. Let's try to create a way to test that in the cheapest, easiest way possible. That's, so those are some ideas. Yes? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, testing itself is fairly expensive. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It is harder. Um, it can be harder. Uh, there's again, it's it's kind of like getting creative and thinking out of the box. So, like when Palm Pilot came out, they actually like made a physical like dummy thing that they would use to see if they liked it, right? And that was level one prototype. Level two prototype was they had this <laughs> little the little frame and they had paper and they would just rather than doing any screen design they had like a little paper and they're like okay you tap this and they would move the paper to the different screens those are some examples um 3d printing helps a lot so with form factor stuff you know 3d printing can help a lot um other than that it's hard like what my main advice is get really clear on the benefits like you know if you're going to outperform someone why is your hardware going to be better than the other hardware get really clear and then ask customers you know, it's not as good as showing them something that is better, but if you say, hey, if our router was 10% faster or whatever, like, you know, try to get at that. And there's some more advanced techniques where you can, you know, again, if it's like, yeah, sure, I want a faster router, why not? There's no trade-off, right? So, so there are some techniques you can use to kind of like test different levels and see which one has the most sensitivity to that, you know? Take an example of, let's say, like a smartwatch, like a Pebble one. Mm-hmm. Like sure. Yeah. Kickstarter, sorry to jump in. Kickstarter is a great way for hardware, right? Then it goes back to the, the economics and the market size. You can just see before you do anything, does anybody even want this thing, right? Yeah. But yeah. The, the first uh, Pebble watches that came out, uh, on, a, on, on the video, they look great, but then they were actually being used. They were like shitty. They would break down. And like, it was a nano. They hacked the nano for it, I think, yeah. right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sell the dream. Uh, and then. Uh, Fake it till you make it, uh, you know. Yeah, well, but I mean, they eventually did pretty good, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who had a Pebble watch here? Anybody? No, we aren't. Yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. But Kickstarter is a great way to reduce the risk and make sure there's enough market demand for what you're going to do. So, 